Hi, I'm Adam, a climate scientist with a PhD from Oxford, sharing what you need to know about climate change. And today I'm not actually sharing on my own. I'm joined by my old friend, Ella Gilbert, aka Dr. Gilbs, here on YouTube. We have met up today for a very special video because it is 10 years since the Paris climate meeting, most exactly 10 years to the day since the Paris climate agreement was reached on the 12th of December, 2015. And I mean, a lot has happened in 10 years. A lot, I think we can say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, a lot is maybe one of the few things we can agree on because a lot of it is good, a lot of it is bad. The Paris climate meeting was COP21. And so we thought what we'd do today is like a good cop, bad cop kind of vibe, where I talk about all the good things that have happened since the Paris climate meeting. So I'll just be telling you all the reasons that the Paris climate agreement is rubbish. Okay, so are you ready to get into it? I'm ready. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> I mean, to start off with, I'm gonna start super basic, but the Paris climate agreement meant that the world agreed on climate change, which is something that now we take for granted a huge amount. But before then, there wasn't really a major structure in place. The Paris Climate Agreement puts this thing in place to say, yeah, climate change is bad and we need to sort it out. And so whatever else Ella is about to say, that is a huge fundamental shift from where we were before December 2015. Yeah, but like that feels like the most utterly basic thing. Like <laughs> climate scientists have been saying for decades that climate change is bad. It's already having bad effects and the effects are going to get worse. So to have an agreement, whilst it is the first time, it was the first time that people had agreed this internationally, that feels so, like, low-hanging fruit, you know? It is low-hanging fruit, but at least it, like, sets a tone for the conversation. At least it sets yeah. the backdrop. And one of the things it sets as a backdrop was really surprising at the time, which is that the Paris Climate Agreement named 1.5 degrees as its more optimistic target for how, how low we should keep global heating to. Yes, but, but I would like to say this is a very uh, like optimistic target and that it wasn't necessarily something that was enshrined in any kind of method of actually getting there. And 1.5, what was it, the, the wording? Pursue efforts to get to 1.5. And that's basically saying like, oh, we'll do it if we have time at the end. Yeah, and to be fair, at the time of the Paris Climate Agreement, I drew the comparison between like a naughty school kid who's like, yeah, I'm gonna get an A plus. And then it's like, oh, sick, what are you actually gonna do to achieve that A plus? And then it's like, yeah, I'd mostly just chill out. <laughs> it's like, so yes, even so, at the time, this limit of 1.5 degrees, it wasn't just that it wasn't really being spoken about in policy. Climate scientists also hadn't studied it nearly enough. And the Paris Climate Agreement really kick-started an effort for researchers to really investigate 1.5 degrees. And now we understand just how important that limit is for the most vulnerable people in the world, as well as the most vulnerable ecosystems in the world. Yes, we know exactly how bad it is going to be <laughs> when, and I say when because it's guaranteed, we blow through one and a half degrees. And also what you said about this idea that, you know, countries haven't got a particular pathway to get to 1.5 or even two degrees in many cases, none of it's enforceable. So mm. whether or not countries say they're going to do something and have a pathway to get there or not, it doesn't matter because no one's going to tell them off if they don't. No one's going to tell them off if they don't get an A+. But at the same time, what Paris really kicked off was a reflection on what it would take to stop climate change, which is ultimately to stop emitting. And a concept which, when I started working on climate science, which was net zero, this idea that in order to stop the world heating, we need to stop emitting entirely. This concept wasn't that common even among scientists I knew when I started working on climate change. Now it's really a part of our common vocabulary that that is the ultimate goal if we're going to stop the world from heating. Yes, and a big important part of that is that the Paris Agreement assumed that countries would increase their ambition as time went on. So like every single five year period, countries would submit more ambitious targets and pledges of how they were going to get to more ambitious emissions cuts every single year. And, you know, whilst I will concede that some of that has happened, it's not enough. It's absolutely not enough. And the kind of policies that we see across the world at the moment are woefully inadequate and definitely not 
what we need to do to get to net zero. I can also concede that that's not happening nearly at the rate we'd need it to. And certainly when it comes to 1.5 degrees, we can see that the efforts have not been pursued in the way that we would need them to be. The other thing is that there's been a real step up in the anti-net zero, the anti environmental policy rhetoric in lots of countries and that's happening across the world you know you see the US sure leave the agreement not yeah. once but twice like this is not enough and what I'd say to this is at least there's something for these far-right organizations and political groups to push back on now you know like when you see Trump stand up in front of the United Nations and go on about how much he hates climate change on the one hand it is really depressing and I made a whole video about all the <laughs> inaccuracies in his speech but on the other hand, it shows that there is a tide that politicians like Trump have to push back against because there is climate action underway now. Yeah, but again, it's the same thing of it's happening, but nowhere near enough, not fast enough and not deep enough. And there's just not enough of it. And I think that's going to be a theme, unfortunately, throughout our entire conversation. But at the same time, I think we can lose track of just how far things have come, especially when we focus, for example, on the United States. We can get a sense that, you know, climate policies are getting rolled back worldwide. In fact, recent research shows that climate policies are getting built up more and more when we look at the entire global picture, especially when it comes to nations in the global south, lower income nations, for example. And this global picture picture is really important because most countries, most companies don't exist within a single island. You know, if you're, for example, a car company in the United States, sure, it makes a bit of a difference that Trump rolls back emissions regulations. But you also want to sell your cars in other countries. And the fact that country is introducing more and more regulations when it comes to climate action is in my view, an unambiguously good thing that is taking us in the right direction. Okay, fine. Well, maybe you're right on that particular one. There's a lot of historical responsibility from countries like the US, like China, like Europe, who have emitted huge amounts of greenhouse gases over the years. And there's no real mechanism to account for that because none of these countries that have historical responsibility want to take responsibility for it. I mean, you say that, but at the same time, finance is a part of the Paris Climate Agreement. Sure. And there are the mechanisms in place for richer nations to support lower income nations, not only with dealing with climate change, but also transitioning away from dependence on fossil fuels. So at least in theory, <laughs> there is mechanism for climate finance. Yes. And and it's only been recently agreed. You know, Paris happened in 2015. The mechanism for climate finance was only really agreed at the COP that I went to, which is COP27. And the ambition is to get to 1.3 trillion by 2035. That feels like a long way off. Well, let's look at what has happened in the last 10 years and how much the picture has changed in the last 10 years. So before Paris, the kind of status quo, the expectation for how much global heating we're in for by the end of the century was around four degrees Celsius, which is just a huge catastrophic amount of heating. Since Paris, so the realistic amount of warming we can expect by the end of the century, it's more like 2.6, 2.7 degrees. Now, crucially, this is obviously, you don't need to be a mathematician, this is obviously higher than 1.5 degrees or the fundamental target of the Paris Climate Agreement, which is well under two degrees. But still, shrinking that amount of warming down will save huge numbers of lives and is an absolutely significant achievement. Yes, it is. And I'm going to say the same thing again as I've been uh. saying for every single artist. Like, yes, but not enough. And you said it yourself, in fact. Like, it's not enough. It's not 1.5 degrees. And sure, 2.6 or 2.7 or 2 is better than 4. But these are also projected changes. That assumes that governments stick to their plans. It assumes that there aren't things that we don't know about lurking that are going to come in and bite us in the bum. But you could also say it assumes that the policies we've got today don't become more ambitious over time. And they have become more ambitious over the past 10 years. We've shrunk the amount of warming that we're in for by 1.3 degrees. So yes, it assumes a great amount, but it assumes it in both directions. Sure. And since Paris was signed, we've seen 0.3 degrees of warming, and that has translated into a real terms 
detriment to people's lives, the loss of lives, the loss of livelihoods, the destruction of ecosystems. And that's in within the time frame of this landmark agreement having been signed. I think it's really useful to have some kind of like practical sense in mind of what this change in amount of warming we're in for means. And our friends at World Weather Attribution have actually run the numbers for various countries for various kinds of heat waves. So they looked, for example, at a five day heat wave in Burkina Faso and Mali. And uh, before climate change, you would have expected a heat wave like this to happen around once every thousand years. Now, by the time we got to the Paris climate deal, we'd already had a whole bunch of global warming. That was now a once in every 400 year event. Today, just 10 years later, it's a one in every 50 year event. So just in the last 10 years with this amount of warming. Now, let's think about the warming we're in for by the end of the century. If we didn't have the Paris climate agreement, we'd expect this heat wave to happen every single year. So something without global warming would have been a one in a thousand year event would be happening roughly annually. With the Paris Climate Agreement, it's once every two years. So look, I'm not saying that this is great, that like the Paris Climate Agreement has saved the day and we're not in any trouble. That's a huge change from once every thousand years. But it's also a huge change from if we didn't have the Paris Climate Agreement. True. My famous favorite, favorite? My favorite phrase is coming back at you. <laughs> Yes, but not enough. It is a killer <laughs> argument, but it starts with yes. So I'm just going <laughs> to take that as you agree with me and move on to my next point. And my next point is that because of all these things we've been speaking about, because of all the changes in policy, because of the change in expectation for where the world's headed, that's really changed how we approach energy. And renewables, wind, solar, as well as batteries, have become staggeringly cheap. Renewable projects are now cheaper than the fossil fuel alternatives would be to build in over 90% of cases. The world is building staggering amounts of solar and wind, amounts that would have just been impossible to imagine a decade ago. No, of course, that is a really important uh, success. The only thing I would say to that is there is huge amount of subsidies going into fossil fuels, depending on your estimates, between 1.3 and 7 trillion a year. Like That is an astonishing amount of money. And that means that fossil fuels are still so entrenched in the way that we do everything, the way that we live our everyday lives, the way that we drive our cars or heat our homes or all of these things. We're a long way from a fossil fuel free economy, energy system. But at least now it's starting to feel imaginable. You know, at least now we're seeing the tools come out of the blueprints and into the real world at huge scales. We're not at that world yet, but that world is starting to be built all around us. All right, fine. I'll, I'll give you that one, maybe. And I will say this. <laughs> when you look at global emissions, at the time of the Paris Climate Agreement, it just seemed that global emissions were going to rise effectively indefinitely. That's not how it works anymore. Global emissions have finally flatlined, which is just an incredible change since the Paris Climate Agreement came into force. We do need them to go down, though. That's yeah, crucial. Yeah. So flatlining, yeah, I mean, fine. That is better than increasing on their inevitable upwards march. But also, if we want to make our temperatures are held at 1.5 or even 2 degrees, they need to start going down. And we need to start changing the way that we do things to make that happen. Yeah, and that can't happen soon enough. That's the kind of thing that we really wish had happened as soon as the Paris Climate Agreement was signed. At the same time, another thing that seemed to be like a fundamental law of how energy worked was, was China. You know, whenever you'd have these discussions, it's like, well, what can the rest of the world do when China's emissions are increasing as rapidly as they are? Well, that part of the story has also been rewritten. China's emissions have actually started to fall, albeit by a very small amount, by around 1% year on year. But the idea that China's emissions are now falling because they're building so many renewables, that is just such a fundamental, unexpected shift that we've seen over actually just the last year or two. China is still a huge amount of the world's emissions. Still a long way to go. 
Now, we've been speaking a lot about the amount of heating we're in for, and that's based on the current policies and our current understanding of the physical system. The amazing organization Climate Action Tracker, they estimate how much warming we're in for for different possible scenarios, and that includes an optimistic scenario. What this scenario means is, let's listen to what all the leaders around the world are saying about net zero. Let's take it at face value and how much warming are we in for then? When you take all that into account, we're actually in for less than two degrees of heating by the end of the century. Now granted, this is the optimistic scenario, but what I find incredible about this is this is what our leaders actually say they wanna do. The challenge now is actually getting them to put their actions where their mouths are. I feel like I'm mixing my metaphors. And the idea that our leaders are even talking the talk, I find, pretty incredible. It is incredible. It is optimistic. It assumes a whole bunch of stuff. It assumes that A, politicians will do what they say they're going to do. I will leave that up to you to decide how <laughs> likely that is. It also assumes that the things that they say they're going to do will translate into the levels of warming that we think they will. We of course need to hold our leaders to account, but I think there's a lot of ifs in that equation. There are a lot of ifs, but at least we've got something to hold our leaders to account too. And we're seeing this in court cases around the world. For example, in Switzerland, when elder women took their government to court and won for failing to do enough to protect their health. We're now seeing a precedent where governments can be held to account for failing to do enough because governments have all signed up to this agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement. At least now we've got a structure to try to try and hold them to account. Yeah, okay. Like I obviously lots of the points you made are ex extremely convincing. <laughs> yes, I'm very convinced. <laughs> <laughs> very compelling arguments, Adam. The main take home message here is that it's it's really nuanced. There's no clear positive outcome from Paris. There's no it's really clearly negative. There's lots of yes ands, there's lots of yes buts, there's lots of no buts about whether the Paris Agreement ultimately has been successful or fa uh, a failure. I mean, ultimately, I do feel like we're starting as a society, as a planet, to take our first tentative steps in the right direction. Now, we ought to be sprinting full speed ahead in that direction, but even the fact we're heading in that direction is something that really couldn't be taken for granted or even expected before the Paris Climate Agreement. Yeah, I think the main overarching thing for me is just yes, but not fast enough, not enough. And look, honestly, there are going to be a lot of people out there who say we've done nothing on climate change or people on the flip side who say the Paris Climate Agreement was a huge success and it's case closed. And that's ultimately not what either of us want to do. And if you value two climate scientists whose goal it is to bring you the nuance on things as complicated as the Paris Climate Agreement, then do make sure you subscribe to both of our channels. Nothing to I add to that. I have nothing to add to nothing that. Nothing to add to <laughs> just nodding. Okay, great. Okay, thanks a lot for watching. Until next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Sorry, I just heard an innuendo on what you said. <laughs>